Epi family, happy Sunday to each and every one of you. Let me first say that I love you and appreciate you each and every week. It is my absolute privilege and honor to be able to serve you and to lead the Epic Nation. Uh, for those of you who watch the replay, I know we have family members who make it a, a personal point, whether they're working, whether they are anywhere else to make sure that they don't miss. I appreciate you. Could you do me a favor? If you're watching the replay, I'm going to talk first to those who are not live. Drop a comment and let me know you're watching, number one. And number two, we'd love to be able to go back and see some of the things that stood out to you. So let us know. Don't just watch idly. Uh, drop your notes because those notes assist us, especially helps me to be able to see things that I could go in more detail on or things you might have questions about. So that's going to be powerful for us. And for those of you who are live right now, shout out to every partner of the Epic Nation. If you've already decided to make this your church and you know I'm your pastor, I just need you need you to drop epic in the chat. Drop epic in the chat. I'm so honored to each and every one of you all, and I love you to life. Shout out to you week in, week out. So we've been in this phenomenal series, family, and to my YouTube and Facebook family. We've been in a series entitled Halftime Pep Talk. Now, what is that about? Well, in prayer, some time ago, I began to hear Spirit of the Lord tell me, bring everyone in to quote unquote the locker room now i can't say i heard locker room but it's the picture that i had in my head where at any sporting event in one locker room i pictured a team being down and the strategy that the coach would give the team that's down sometimes it's encouragement sometimes it's challenging them but most importantly creating a new strategy to come from behind and win in the second half well that's what i believe god is doing is encouraging some of some of us motivating us and challenging us to do more become more so we can have more to win in the second half of 2023. Uh, most importantly, there are some of us that are in the other locker room where we've been winning and we've got to steward the lead to make sure that we don't lose the progress that God has done for us in our life. And that's the basis of Halftime Pep Talk, to help those of us who are winning, whether it's in our marriages and we want to make sure that that continues, we steward that. Whether it's in our time, we feel like we've had a productive year. We steward the, our win to maintain the lead in the second half of the year. And for some of us, we feel like, man, it seems like the year got away from me. And I haven't done or even began on the things that I put on the list. Well, you still have time because God works in the space of acceleration immediately and suddenly. But we cannot progress in our life without clear principle and strategy. And that's what this series typifies for us. Well, we started... We started last week on, I think, one of the most important conversations surrounding creating a winning strategy, and that's the conversation and idea surrounding faith. Somebody type faith in the chat, F-A-I-T-H. We don't talk enough about faith. We talk a whole lot about money, but I think because we don't realize that faith is the money slash currency of the kingdom of God, that God does not use money. The angels don't need it. God does not use it. So the way in which you receive what you need is to exchange your faith for whatever you're asking God for. So in essence, faith would be the financial system that God has put in place where he has deposited into every believer. The Bible says he's dealt to all of us a measure of faith. So God deposited faith in us, and it's our job to steward and to grow that faith so we can exchange it to God for whatever we need. How do we receive that faith? This is just the beginning, foundation. How do we receive that faith? You got saved by faith. And the moment you did, the faith that got you saved, God deposited faith in God. And that became the deposit and the investment God gave for you to grow your faith. Faith in God was enough for you to grow to have faith in everything else, right? That's the foundation. So with that in mind, last week we started a conversation I want to dive into. Let's pull it up on the screen. Thank you to everybody. I got, I, we got to cook. We got 30 something minutes. Why do I tell you the time each week? Because I'd be trying to put my put pressure on me to not talk too long. <laughs> and then every week I ask y'all for 10 minutes and y'all say, go ahead, take your time. Like, right. So this so this time I'm not going to ask y'all for 10 more minutes. I'm going to just do what I can with the, with the time that I have. We write back in the same text we were in last week, uh, Mark chapter 11. I just can't move on like that. All right, let's start. Mark chapter 11, it's on the screen. The next morning as they passed by the fig tree, he had cursed the disciples. Notice it had withered from the roots up. The disciples noticed, very important point, it had withered from the roots up. Peter remembered what Jesus had said. I'm in verse 21. 
to the tree on the previous day and exclaimed, look, Rabbi, the tree you curse has withered and died. Peter remembered. Peter remembered. So verse before that, and they noticed. Next verse, Peter remembered. So they noticed and they remembered. Oh, my God. I was telling Charity earlier how like words mean so much to me and I sit with them and it makes it difficult for me to just breeze past things in scripture. Why? Because if in the beginning was the word, I am not just reading phrases and texts and syntax. I'm not just reading vowels and, and consonants. What I am really reading and explaining and espousing is pieces of my savior, which is Christ, who is the word. So the Bible says, if everything that Jesus had done would be written in a book, no book would hold it, which means everything I read in the Gospels is there for a reason. Because if there, if we couldn't document everything that, he, that Jesus did, why do we have that? That's my approach to Scripture. So I pay closer attention to it because I realize something else could be there, but this is there for a reason. That, that ought to help you already when you read your Bible. Did that help you? All right. Peter, remember what Jesus had said to the tree on the previous day and exclaimed, look, Rabbi, the fig tree you curse, I'm in verse 21, has withered and died. Verse 22, then Jesus said to the disciples, have faith in God. I'm, I'm going to read 23 and 24, but I know I'm not going to get to it. Next week, we'll get to it. Y'all know how I am. I tell you the truth, verse 23, you can say to this mountain, may you be lifted up and thrown into the sea and it will happen, but you must really believe it will happen and have no doubt in your heart. It could happen, but you must really believe that it could happen. Verse 24, I tell you, you can pray for anything. And if you believe that you've received it, it will be yours. Let's go back to verse 21. Peter remembered, come on, back to 21. And Peter remembered what Jesus had said to the tree on the previous day and exclaimed, look, Rabbi, the fig tree you curse has withered and died. I, I, ladies and gentlemen, I got 31 minutes to tell you uh, I'm mad at Peter and my message today is because uh, Peter got on my nerves when I was studying the scripture. And I, I want to stand, I want to speak as if I was there with the rest of the disciples when Peter exclaimed, Rabbi, look, the tree that you, the, the tree that you, that you curse has withered and died. I want to interrupt the conversation and say to Peter, what is the title of my subject today? I'm not surprised. Uh, Peter, you're surprised, but I'm not surprised because I know what it's like to see God, to hear God say something and see God keep his word. So you're surprised, but I'm not surprised. Ladies and gentlemen, I won't have time to even teach it, but I need to go into a preaching point before I even pray and start my message. Can I, can I go, can I go there? Epic Nation, can I go there and say really quick why this subject of I'm not surprised is so important? If we were talking about me, I would be surprised because I have promised myself things and didn't keep my word to myself. I have promised people things and didn't keep my word to people. Now, it wasn't my intention to break my promise, but somehow and sometimes my inconsistencies, my selfishness, time and my limitations, I can only be in one place at a time. So I've missed flights that made me miss moments that I promised to be at. I have overpromised and been stretched thin and couldn't be there. I've gotten sick. I've, I fell asleep. I've overslept. So I'm surprised at myself when I do things. But when it comes to our Lord and Savior, I'm not surprised because everything he promised, he's done. He's not a man that he should lie or the son of man that he should repent. If he said it, he'd make it good. So the same God who said, let there be, and it was, is the same God that says to me, it can be, and it was, and it is. I'm not surprised when God say he's going to do something, and it actually happened. Type in the chat if you got faith to believe that I ain't surprised. God said it's going to happen, and it's going to happen. For some of you, you got a word over your year that God promised you some things this year. Krisha, come here. T t I need you to talk in all caps. Yell at me in the chat. I'm not surprised. Oh, look, money came in. Well, I prayed for it, so I'm not surprised. Oh, look, it's the thing that I asked God for, and now I have it. I'm not surprised. Don't miss this. I'm grateful, but I'm not surprised. <laughs> that money's coming, coming back. I'm grateful, but I'm not surprised. Let's teach. Father, in the name of the only one that is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above what I can ask, think, dream, or imagine. You've got a will, you've got thoughts, you've got intellect, you've got wisdom. 
So I'm never surprised when you do nothing more than be what you've always been. Long before I had a prayer life or request, you were already God. You had a running start throughout eternity. I just started asking you for things, but you've always been able to provide them. So God, today, it is my responsibility to build the faith of your people, to start believing that you are who you said you are. You'll do what you said you'll do. You'll be what you've always been. Our request is not for you to give us more things, but our request is for you to just be God and for us to notice what you are. Father, make us acutely aware of your consistent presence all around us and your words spoken over us. We believe, we receive, and it is so. I'm asking you for this and more, starting now, in Jesus' name, amen. We got work to do, family. Let's go to work. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, epic family, I got to start today's message, and I got less than 27 minutes, so if your attention span is short and you zooming out, you're going to miss it. I'm not slowing down. Come here. Come here. Mama got to go to work. Daddy almost late. <laughs> Come here. So I got three questions I got to ask you in the introduction of this text, and I need you to write them down. And I'm not going to be loud. I'm not going to use preacher tone. I'm going to use conversational language in this message. Number one question I've got to ask you, if you can ask God for one thing and know with 100% certainty that the answer would be yes and you would receive it, what would you ask for? If you could ask God, let's put that on the screen, and I know I'm going to word it differently, but it's okay. If you could ask God for one thing and know with 100% certainty that he would grant your request of wh what would you ask for? Would you ask for more money? Would you ask for money? Would you ask for a relationship? Would you ask for a better relationship? See the distinction? Would you ask for ideas? Would you ask for a specific idea? Would you ask for connections? Would you ask for a connection to a specific person? It is a big difference, ladies and gentlemen, and I hope you're seeing the small important. When I say ask for a relationship, that's broad. When I say ask for a better relationship, that's specific. When I say ask for money, would you ask for a specific amount of money? That's different. When I say ask for an idea, that's broad. That means you've got no picture in your head of what idea and you expect God to request or ask for God. Give me an idea that produces generational wealth and allows me to grow visibility to be able to impact more people with the message you've given me. That's specific. <laughs> That's specific. So, ladies and gentlemen, first and foremost, as I'm posing the question of if you can ask God for something with 100 percent certainty and know that he would grant the request of what you ask, what would you ask for? The addendum to that question is. Would it be specific or broad? Most of us approach God on the basis of broad strokes. So when God answers, we don't know that he answered. So we are surprised because we had no picture of what we wanted. We ask God, God, help me, help me to be happy. Well, what does happiness look like? God, help me to get a job. Well, what does the job look like? If you don't know what you're looking for, when you see it, you won't notice it. If you don't know what you're praying for, when God grants it, you won't notice it. What I'm saying to you is, it is a distinction between God, I need more money, and God, I need $300,000 within 30 days. <laughs> when I pray, I pray specifics. Why? Because when you specifically request something, it paints a picture in your mind that you can attach faith to. This is good already. This is good already. I'm your pastor, so I got to teach you. So the number one question, and write this in your playbook, ladies and gentlemen, because I want you to meditate on this. Don't just throw out something. Don't do word vomit, where you just say something in the moment. If I ask you right now, you'll drop it in the chat, and it might not be the core of what you really want. It'll just be a prompt response that lacks depth, substance, and thought. If you can ask God for one thing and know with 100% certainty that he would grant your request, what would you ask for? Question number two. Question number two. Are you ready? Question number two. Are y'all ready for question number two? Connected to question number one, if you can ask God for any, any one thing and know 100% certainty he will grant your request, what would you ask for? Number two, how often would you ask? How often would you ask? Now, how often would you ask? I'm not going to tell you what my answer is on that one. How often would you ask? 
How often would you ask? That's question number two. And question number three, do you, do you consistently ask God about those things now? Whatever that one thing is, do you consistently talk to God about it daily? Well, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, the thing that I asked you is not rhetorical. It's not an Aladdin type story. It is not a rubber genie in a bottle. The Bible has clearly painted to us that when we pray, believe we have received it already. So if you can ask God for one thing, you can, and you can know with 100% certainty that he will grant it. Jesus explains this. This is not a random person telling you this. This is the son of God, one who is equal to God, one who is God, who said, when you pray, believe you've received it already. So he's saying that the prerequisite of a granted request is to believe that the thing that I ask God, I must know with 100% certainty that it will be granted. When I asked you the question, most of you thought it was rhetorical. You didn't realize it was a principle that is founded in our faith and founded in our prayer. So it's not a hypothetical. It's the expectation. So when I ask and I receive, I shouldn't be surprised. This is my message today. I shouldn't be surprised. Now, I asked you the second question, how often would you ask? Well, the Bible says that, that we ought to pray without ceasing. So that means whatever that one thing is should be communicated with a daily. And the third question is, do you consistently talk to God about it now? And if you do not, you, I just gave you what should be your daily prayer point. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, put this on the screen. Most of us do not consistently pray about what matters most to us. Most of us do not consistently pray about what matters most to us. We have broad stroke prayers where we talk to God about a list of things. And sometimes we think that we are insulting God by, by being intentional and specific about our requests. So we dance around the subject, thanking God for everything except the thing we want, talking to God about everything except the thing that we want, requesting from God more of your power, more of your glory, when the truth is that ain't really what we want. What we want is more money. Father, we just ask for more of you. I'm not saying don't ask for those things, but we got to be honest. Most of our hearts and most of our desires and our one thing is not more of that. It's more of the other thing. So we dance around with broad strokes and our prayer life becomes hollow, empty, and lacks faith because we believe the only way to receive the thing we want is by asking for the things that we don't want. Which means the prayer lacks substance, it lacks faith, it lacks belief in your relationship with God because you think that you can manipulate an all-knowing God as if he does not know that the thing that you are requesting is not really the thing that's the burden of your heart. Lord, I just want to know your word more. I'm not saying don't want those things. I'm not saying don't desire them. You should. I'm not saying don't pray for them. You should pray for those. But what I'm saying is you should also pray for the one thing that you desire most. One thing have I desired that shall I seek after. That's what David said, that I will dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of the trouble, he shall hide me. This is what David said. It was his earnest and honest request. But my question to you is, what is your honest request? We have broad conversations. We casually repeat phrases that is hollow. I did the same. When I first came into my faith, I used to try to pray like my mother because like her, her prayer life is like Drake. Like my mama like Drake with the words. Like, you know, how Drake got wordplay. Lil Wayne got wordplay. Like you're like, oh, that was smooth. My mama, when it comes to prayer, she could have been a prayer rapper. Shout out to moms. Love you. Like she could have like, and Lord, we thank you for being. And she used to be talking about my shield and my buckler. She started calling them stuff that she remembered from the farm that she grew up on. But I didn't grow up on a farm. So some of the words, I didn't even know what they meant, but they sound good. So I used to say it, right? <laughs> she go, oh, you, you're, my, you're my fence. You're my bulwa. You're my billa. And I'm like, what is a bulwa and a billa? You're my pavilion. You're my shelter in the time of trouble. 
You are the hedge around around the fence that keeps us. She was, was I can't remember. It was, I mean, something to mur something about her breast that was in Song of Solomon's, the the mur between my breasts, and the, the, I don't know. It was just like, and now I'm over there and I'm talking about you the mur between my breasts and the and the and the, the lily of the and I'm like, I've never seen a lily of a valley, and I'm like, I'm just I'm asking for all this stuff. <laughs> You the mur between my breasts and the bomb bomb of a of a god dad Gilead son Gilead uh, the uh, the Gilead <laughs> you the you the bomb of a Gillette I'm calling it the shaving cream you the bomb of of Gillette <laughs> oh like, bro bro I'm just repeating phrases that I don't know what they mean because it sound good when she said it but instead what if i could ask god for one thing and know with 100 percent certainty he will grant my request how often would i how often would i ask for it and am i currently asking for it daily this is so good already so ladies and gentlemen boys and girls we approach god under the basis this is good already are y'all enjoying this Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, we approach God typically under the basis of God being our Lord, but not our lover. So our expectation is for him to do Lord things, you know, the ruler, owner of our lives. We expect when we got saved for God to save us as Lord. We expect God to forgive us. We know that he's our savior. We approach him as savior. We expect when we repent for it to happen. We expect him to answer prayers. So we, we approach him as savior and as Lord but we forget that he's lover which means he's in relationship with me he has affection towards me he has closeness and don't miss this and generosity so we approach god under the basis of lord and savior he's our owner our ruler and we know that he's our savior that i am saved we don't question our salvation but we never approach god as our lover forgetting the fact that god so love so when someone loves you there is an, there is an expectation i'm not surprised when the person who loves me does something for me i'm oh i'm in my, i'm in my subject now i'm not surprised i'm grateful i'm not surprised when charity cooks for me i'm grateful but i'm not surprised and i am surprised when it tastes good i can't even lie i'm like oh mm, flavor salt pepper okay and you cook and you cook my salmon long enough i don't like that pale salmon i like mine crispy oh, man. oh I'm, i am surprised when the flavors hit right when, when we leave the hot sauce out of it and we are okay y'all pray for her she learning she getting better she getting better i had a delicious breakfast uh wrap this morning that was really good from glory be to god the one thing i asked for i know with 100 certainty lord bless her with cooking <laughs> all right so let me get back in my text well, let me get back in my text so i'm not surprised when someone loves me does something nice for me it i'm not surprised so we should not be surprised but we should be grateful this is so good we should not be surprised but we should be grateful now i know it's a mental shift because for some of us we think that not being surprised means that we're not grateful no my hope is built on nothing less than jesus blood and righteousness me i dare not trust like this trust that we have and a god that loves me who has the best of intentions of me and will be generous towards me so i am not surprised when god bless me but i am grateful for his blessings most of us need to shift where we can now say i know that he is my lord i know he's my savior but we need the same level of expectation when it comes to him being our lover and expressing generosity, love, and affection, blessings, favor, and grace, because the same God that is your Lord and Savior is the same God that is your lover. These messages have been so good, I don't know if y'all even understand. Is that not powerful? Is that not a note to write down? I need someone before I move forward to pause and just write in the chat, I know he loves me. I know he loves me. He, he's my lover. He's my lover. I call I call my my baby my baby girl Rain. I call her Love Muffin. That's my love muffin. It's my baby. He asks me for anything, and it is my pleasure to give it to her. It is not a chore. Now, what is my only expectation 
of what I give to her. Gratitude. It is not a chore. She don't have to beg me for it. I call charity love or love life. It is not a chore to do things for her. It's my pleasure. The only thing I request is acknowledge me and what I am and the sacrifice that it takes to provide for you. She ain't got to work a day in her life as long as I got breath in my body and intellect and God keeps blessing me financially. But the thing I don't expect is for you to ignore what it takes for me to free you up that you don't have the burden or the responsibility of working. I expect gratitude. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, on the foundation of our relationship with God, it is not a chore for God to do things for you and for God to bless you with things. The expectation is that you will always be grateful and you will notice what God is doing in your life. As we transition into this beautiful pregnant text, that was so good already. As we transition into this beautiful pregnant text with less than 15 minutes to unpack the complexities of this text, and I got this week and next week to do it, we must point our attention to verse number 20. Because in verse 20, number 20, it is a continuation of something that is happening. And the Bible says in verse 20, the next morning as they pass by. Now, you can't ignore when you read scripture the next morning. It is a continuation of them just leaving from the temple where he overturned the tables and said, you have turned my father's house to a den of thieves instead of a house of prayer. This is a continuation of him entering into Jerusalem. This is a continuation of him finding the donkey that had been tied up and him on his way to be crucified. So end the next morning. As they passed by the freak fig tree, which yesterday Jesus had cursed, but today they're passing by it. Makes sense now. The disciples notice. I'm right there. I'm right there. The disciples notice. I'm right there. The disciples notice. I'm right there. I am starting to question. They've been around him this long. How much of what Jesus was and how much of what Jesus did did they not notice? It was so easy for them to see him as rabbi but they had a tough time seeing him as the Christos, the Christ. He had to reveal to them, yo, I am the Christ mentioned in scripture. I am the savior that you're waiting on. So they, they walked with him for three years. And just like they didn't notice, they, they finally come to notice the fig tree. They're finally coming to notice that this is the savior that was prophesied about. How many things in our life that God has been and how many times have God been with us and we are just coming to notice? <laughs> the disciples notice. The disciples notice. One, one of my prayers, God help me to notice the activity of God in my life. Because sometimes I, I start praying about stuff that I don't notice God already fixed. You're like, hey, you can go and leave that. You know that's already taken care of. You can go and move to the next thing. Yeah. It, and Lord, if you if you would give me, give, I, I have it already. The disciples notice the disciples notice now here's what's important text put it back on the screen they notice it had withered from the roots now this is so important to me most of us i gotta unpack this unpack the, the the distinction between the fruit and the root the fruit and the root the fruit and the root most of us are able to see our penalty but we can't see the thing that caused it we're able to see the reward, but sometimes we ignore the thing that caused it. So the reward is the figs. The thing that caused the reward is the, is the root. God, have I been faithful to you? So faith might be the root. The thing that I had faith for is the fruit. Makes sense. So if I have no faith in the root, there are no figs to grow as the fruit. The results of my life is the results of the roots of my faith. And the deeper the roots of my faith, the more results you see in my life. So the cause of all that happens in my life is the root that I have in my relationship with God that I don't just see him as savior. I don't just see him as Lord. My surprise typically means I lacked faith and I lacked asking God for my one thing. See, sometimes we know what happened, but not why it happened. The why is the root. The what is the fruit. So if we want to change what keeps happening, we have to change the root of why it keeps happening. Underneath bad relationships is bad decision making. So the root 
of bad relationships <laughs> is bad decisions. The fruit is the person choosing wrong. <laughs> Good Lord of mercy. Good Lord. Of, the, the root of, of, of discontentment, the root of unhappiness, the root of arguments, the root sometimes of things not working out is the is the root of self-sabotaging behavior bad thinking so what god has to do is get us to notice much like peter the root good god almighty and the bible says here we go the next morning as they passed by the fig tree he had cursed the disciples noticed it had withered from the root i pray that god helps you to notice the root of your problems Ooh, not the fruit. Why does this keep going on? Why do I keep going through this? I pray that God helps you to spot the root and he curses the thing that is causing for your life to not grow, for things to not grow, for things to not develop. And he begins to then curse it and you notice that it is removed and now new expectation can rise and you can grow new roots and new fruit. I had, I had to go there. I had to go there. I had to go there. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. I gotta, I gotta move. I gotta move. Last now, last week, I began to explain to you that faith differs. Faith differs, ladies and gentlemen, from optimism and positive thinking, because I said I'm gonna say this again. Faith differs from optimism and and hope and positive thinking. Faith differs from optimism. Optimism hopes for the best without the guarantee of it ever arriving. However, kingdom hope. Is faith looking at the promises of what God already said he'd do. So optimism differs from faith because faith has its root in God. Optimism has its root in things. There is no, and I'm not saying don't have optimism, but the only way to have hope and optimism is for your faith to have a source. When I believe for something, my belief is only as strong as my belief in God. Nothing arrives in my life without a source. So optimism for some people is not rooted in anything other than hoping for the thing in and of itself. Positive thinking is just believing and thinking on a thing, but we can't just think on a thing, we must think on God. Makes sense now. Now here's why this is important and I had to revisit this thought. Please don't let me lose you. Here's why this is important and I had to revisit this thought. Because if we think that optimism, positive thinking and faith alone like by itself is able to progress our life, change our life or give us whatever we want, whatever we're praying for. Here's why this is bad because you cannot manipulate God. You cannot use faith to reduce the size of God or reduce the sovereignty of God. Let me say it better. Let me say it cleaner. You cannot use faith. Oh, this is going to be powerful charity. You can't use faith to, to reduce or manipulate the sovereignty of God. What does that mean? When I talk about the sovereignty of God I'm talking, or God's self-dependency, his self-sufficiency, you have to remember God has his own will. God has his own purpose. God has his own plan. I can't use faith with my will, my plan, and my purpose to manipulate God's will, God's plan, and God's purpose. Faith does not manipulate God and reduce his sovereignty of having his own will. I'm going to say, me having faith does not mean that I get to reduce the sovereignty of God as if before I was born, God had a will and he still has one. God has a purpose. God has a plan. I have a will, which I surrendered to God when I got saved. I have a purpose, things that I want the original intent and idea of the creator. So we as creators have an original intent and idea. God as a creator has an original intent and idea. We have plans for our life. I want to do this by this time. My faith does not mean I get to take my purpose, my will, my plan, and use optimism and positive thinking to manipulate God's will, God's purpose, and God's plan. Good God Almighty. Say it again, Marcus. When God made us, he made us free will agents it made in the image and likeness of God. We have the ability to have our own will and God does not force his will on us. We get to surrender to his will. So God has a will. 
I have a will. God has a purpose. What is purpose? The original thought and intent of a creator. We have a purpose, an original thought and intention. Sometimes our purpose is not the same as God's purpose. God has a plan. We have a plan. So I'm going to say this clean one more time. Let's look at my hands so you, so you get it. God has a will. We have a will. God has a purpose. We have a purpose. God has a plan. We have a plan. We cannot use our faith to manipulate God's will, God's purpose, and God's plan to perform our will, our purpose, and our plan. Faith, optimism, positive thinking, affirmations, or meditation does not work that way. God is not so weak that your optimism, hope, positive thinking, and faith can destroy or ball up his will, his purpose, and his plan for him to then be at your beck and call and be a flunky to what you want. What must happen is faith is me believing in God that his will, his purpose, and his plan is perfect for me. <laughs> so I do, so this is God's will his purpose and his plan. This is my will, my purpose, and my plan. Faith does this and agrees with this. <laughs> God's will, God's purpose, God's plan. My will, my purpose, my plan. Faith does this, balls up mine and holds on to his. One more time. God's will, God's purpose, God's plan. My will, my purpose, my plan. My faith does not manipulate God to my will, my purpose, my plan. My faith balls up my will, my purpose, and my plan and holds on to God's will, God's purpose, and God's plan. And now I have faith to ask God for things that God has already given to me. His will is for me to have it. So when I agree with his will, I receive it. His, his purpose is perfect for me. So when I agree with his purpose, I walk in purpose, live in purpose, and purpose pays me. His plan is for me to, to prosper. So when I agree with his plan, I receive a plan that I could not even ask for that's beyond what I can think, dream, and imagine. So optimism, hope, positive thinking, meditation, affirmation, speaking those things that be not, is not a plan to reduce God's sovereignty to the level of your requests. It is for us to surrender to God, to hold on to his will, his purpose, and his plan because you are made in the image and likeness of God. So you have the same three things he has. The only assignment on our life and the goal of our life is to surrender ours and hold on to his. And when I, I'm in my, oh, I'm in my, I'm in my subject now. And when I surrender, when I hold on to God's will, God's purpose, God's plan, and I request something from God, I'm not surprised when I receive it. I'm not surprised. Am I teaching this thing? Am I teaching this thing? My subject, ladies and gentlemen, is I'm not surprised. I'm trying to get the believer to move to a place of expectation. That it is not that you are not grateful, but you should not be surprised when God does what he said he's going to do. And God is who he says he is. I'm not surprised at God being God. I'm not surprised at God doing God things. I'm more surprised when in spite of me, God does it. When God empowers me to do a thing that I couldn't do on my own, I'm surprised. <laughs> but I'm not surprised when God does God things. I'm not surprised when it happens fast. Why? Because God can move fast. We move slow. Listen to this. Let, let me build your faith. Most of us believe in the ideology and the concept of things happening incrementally. I'm not surprised when it doesn't happen incrementally because God does not work incrementally. We do. I'm not surprised when it doesn't happen chronologically because man lives in chronological order. God does not. I'm not surprised. Oh my God, are you catching this? When it's a miracle. Why? Because God performs miracles. I'm not surprised when I can't explain it. When something happens in my life that is that defies linguistical boundaries, neurological concepts, and linguistical programming, I'm not surprised when God goes beyond what my words can capture and explain to the human mind. Why? Because God promised that he could do exceedingly and abundantly above what I could ask or think. So I'm not surprised when God does things that I ain't pray for. Why? Because he told me he could. <laughs> so why are you surprised when what you pray for 
you receive. I can't believe I met somebody. Didn't you ask for? I can't believe they called me back for the job. Didn't you ask for? I can't believe I got the grant for the school. Didn't you pray for? I can't believe that I got the opportunity to stand there and speak. Didn't you ask for? The prerequisite of the request, when you pray, believe you've received it already. Y'all, y'all did it to me again. Y'all did it to me again. I had so much more to tell you, but I'm going to pause right there because I need to just build your faith. And next week, I'm right back in 22 through 24. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I look. Can I, can I make a statement as we end? I look to see God. The Bible says, and Peter noticed. Peter noticed. And Peter noticed. Check this out. I look to see God in things that I ask for God to be in. I look to see God involved in things that I re that I requested God's involvement in. <laughs> I look to see God in things that I ask for God to be in. If I invite God into my heart, I expect God to see. I expect to see God in my heart. If I invite God into my mind, I expect God to see, see God in my mind. If I invite God into my business, I expect to see God in my business. If I invite God into my marriage, I expect to see God in my marriage. So when God shows up and takes something that could not work before and make it start working, I'm not surprised, but I'm grateful. Thank you for changing it. The discontentment, the arguments, the frustration, thank you for changing it. The, the tenseness, the, the bad financial months, but I ask God to get involved and give me innovative ideas and I pray for new clients. I pray for new revenue. I pray for new resources. I'm not surprised, but God, I'm grateful. My message to you today, if you, if you take away nothing else, if you take away nothing else and I got to finish this up next week, I want to take you back to the beginning of this message and ask you this, this question. If you can ask God, for one thing, and know with 100% certainty he would grant your request, what would you ask for? If you knew that it was yours already, how often would you ask? And the third question, why are you not asking for it? The only prerequisite is to believe you received it already. But the only way to have that level of belief is for you to remember that faith does not reduce the sovereignty of a divine God who is om, om, omniscience, all knowledge, who is omnipotent, all power, who is omnipresent. So I must look at God's will, God's purpose, and God's plan. Examine my purpose, my will, my purpose, my plan. Reduce it, remove it, and attach myself to his. And when he does what is his will, I'm not surprised, but I'm grateful. And when he does, what is his purpose? I'm not surprised, but I'm grateful. And when he does, what is his plan? I'm not surprised, but I'm eternally grateful that he can do anything, anywhere, with anybody. Father, may this message hit the hearts and minds of your people. May it resonate crescendoing, not just to those that are actively online now watching, but those that will watch this even years from now and months from now. God, from now to the end of the year, I pray that this message will reach the person that you want to reach. May they stumble on it. They think it's by accident, but I'm not surprised. Many will, will think that it was an accident, that they just it just happened to pop up on their YouTube or on their Facebook. Some of them watching it right now think it's an accident, but God, let us be intentional about sharing this with others. But I pray for every listener, every person that this was a seed sowed into their heart, that they might now have new faith in you, that they expect to receive with 100% certainty. This is the strategy for the next half of the year, for the next half of the year. It's that we might have faith in God who cannot fail, that we might believe that you are who you say you are. There's no greater strategy than the strategy of faith, because without it, it's impossible to please you. I'm believing you for this and more. God, I pray for an increase in faith without struggle, an increase in faith without trial, an increase in faith without testing, that your people might grow in their faith without going through hardships. So I pray for strength training 
without burden and pressure, let their faith grow by an experience with you of what you can do. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a phenomenal Sunday, family. I want to invite you to be a part of the Epic Nation. If you don't have a church home or you and you, and you know, you're like, man, I've never learned the way I'm learning now. This is simple. It makes sense. The way you explain it, I, this is what I need to be a part of. I would love to be your pastor. We would love to be your church. Type the word partner in the chat and we'll reach out to you and show you how you can become a part of, of the Epic Nation. Number two, but those of you who say, man, I want to grow and progress in my faith. You mentioned that part earlier about knowing him as Lord and Savior, but not lover. Well, you're like, I, I, don't, I don't know if I completely know him as Lord or as Savior. We want to invite you. Type the word salvation. Salvation. We want to lead you into the greatest relationship you can ever have is a relationship with Christ. A relationship with Christ. So number one, we type partner if you want to be a partner of the Epic Nation. Number two, type salvation. If you know you're ready to give, to rededicate or dedicate and give Christ your life. And number three, if you want to express generosity to say, man, I received from this. So I want to give something to it. That's just how life, life works. When someone, when someone uh, takes time to do something for us, when someone serves us, we express our gratitude in the form of generosity. So we want to give you an opportunity to contribute and to express gratitude in the form of generosity towards the epic nation that allows us to do ministry in november we have a, a conference coming up our family reunion epic fest we'll be putting those dates out it costs us to do ministry family but even if it did not i think sometimes it's not sometimes we we say things in church settings trying to justify get or convince people of something that is our natural indication everywhere except church I go places to eat. I just went the other day and the service was so bad that I promised myself I'll never eat there again. But I still couldn't pull myself to not tip a server who ruined my mood. Generosity is common everywhere except church. It's the only place that we can go and receive something that blesses us, helps us, serves us, grows us, educates us and feel no way about generosity. So as your pastor, I'd be wrong to not express what is a foundation of our faith, which is generosity. It's not to manipulate you or get you to do anything. You choose and this between you and God, whatever you decide to do. Your resources does not go to me. I'm good. I've been blessed by God and I'm not surprised because I follow the principles. All right. Have a phenomenal day. I love you and I will see you soon. Let's play Heaven's Best Confession. I'm in the right place. I'm in the right place.